Joining us today on the Outer Limits of Inner Truth is Chris Krepsik. He's from the HoodedSage.com. Chris is a etheric energy healer. He's a metaphysical teacher. He's got a lifetime of training in the mystical arts and ancient wisdom. He had worked with one of the greatest metaphysicians the world had ever seen, Mr. Stuart Wilde. And Chris teaches thousands and thought millions of people a lot of the ways of ancient teachings and metaphysics. And Chris, we are so honored to have you today with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Chris, can you please explain to us what is a hooded sage and how, what is some of the basis of some of your uh, founding teachings? Well, the hooded sage is um, an ancient wisdom. It's the initiates that went down through history, um, primarily those of the Taoist sages in old China in about 500 B.C. Um, there were initiates in um, the Etruscans um, in Italy. Um, and basically, say, like the, the Druids and such from thousands of years ago in, in Ireland and England, but it's not just um, those groups. It's um, basically your higher self. If you visualize in your meditations your higher self as being like a hooded sage, you can bring that energy around you like a blanket, and it's a way of merging with your higher self. Okay. Now, your higher self, is this your energy field or energy spirit that exists outside the uh, physical plane, is it? Is your higher self on the physical plane or is it outside the physical plane? And is your higher self um, your true spirit that is providing conscious and life force to all of your other life incarnations that could be happening, happening simultaneously? It's not really outside of the physical plane. It's intertwined. Um, the illusion of separation is just an illusion of the mind between the physical and the non-physical. You can train yourself to see energy and you can train yourself to see the higher self and the human energy field, eyes wide open, in 3D. The etheric's a 3D thing. Okay. But it transcends solidity to where there's also the non-solid nature of reality as well. So it, it's like a, um, a barrier um, simply because the mind locks on to solid particles and creates a construct that the mind can handle, Right. So when a person trains their mind to slow down and develops a little bit of perception through different techniques, they can learn to see that human energy field. Now, how would some of those? How would some of the first methods to slowing your energy to slowing your brain down and perceiving these energies? Like, what would be some of the first steps a person would take to begin the process? Um, using metronomes um, in theta ranges would be a good way to start because that slows down the brainwave speeds. Okay. The normal the normal waking state is moving around and the, the brain waves are a bit faster and it's dealing with stuff in 3D and all of that. But if you, if you sit back and just meditate or use a theta metronome, it will slow the brain wave speeds down, which are the, the trance states that you hear of like ancient monks and such reaching. Okay, so hypothetically speaking, um, for the audience out there, you can go on YouTube and you can actually look up various um, beats. They'll have alpha, beta, Delta, Theta, and they do have these metronomes. They are widely available. Now, we'll, what we'll do is that we'll provide a link specifically to some of the ones that Chris uh, has selected or recommends. But when you're at this state, Met Theta, when you are, what, just above a Delta state, and right. you're in this deep meditation, how do these um, visualizations come to you? Do you have to be completely open to them, or may they never come to you? May you maybe you're an individual who's more sensitive to feel more sensitive to sound, is it take somebody who's naturally a visual person to experience these uh, visualizations that you describe? Everybody's a natural visionary. It's just whether or not they choose to develop that. It's like any other muscle in your body. You know, if you got a, if you got a bicep and you want to want to work on it, you lift weights, you develop it. Everybody has the same visionary ability. It's just whether or not they decide to train. Okay. So hypothetically speaking, a person who would devote themselves to a daily regimen of theta metronome, um, and you say meditation, we, can we say like, what, a half hour to an hour being in a constant uh, theta state, focusing your energy, and do you think that over, what, a prolonged period of time it would occur naturally? Definitely, yeah. Okay. 
No, so there's there's different things to it because I know people that have meditated their entire lives that have never really seen anything. So there's also techniques that you have to do, and those are like we call them rotations. It's the ability to learn to move your energy. Okay. Because if you just meditate forever, you could just be stuck in the mind. Sure. You have so, to you have to expand your feelings beyond the mind. Okay, so is that getting on the lines of that you are what an infinite spirit, and that your energy is a part of all things, rather than your energy is delegated from within your body? Well, it's definitely a part of all things. You're a spark of the God force. Like everything, everything is energy, but you do have a uniqueness um, to your own energy field as well. But definitely, it's connected to everything else. Okay. Now, Chris. When did you realize when you were growing up that um, you had this perception and that things were different for you? When, you? when you were a young child, did you start to see things differently or start to perceive some of these realities that you're discussing? Was it something that came naturally to you? When did you or was it something that you, you kind of were passionate about and you devoted yourself and you poured your heart and your mind and your spirit into these teachings that were there and discovered and went further? How did it kind of come into play for you? Well, I always saw things, and I always saw things a little bit differently, too, but I learned at a very early age to be silent about it because most people are a bit freaked out when you start talking about energy and spiritual things. They don't really know how to relate to it, you know. Why don't so I learned at an early age to be quiet and be silent, and basically the teachings are um, based on life, really. Okay, so you're growing up and you're seeing, what are you, what are you particularly seeing? You're seeing angels, are you seeing um, uh, like beings, are you seeing practical type energy, are you seeing like energy before it manifests into physical reality, like what are some of the visualizations you're seeing when you're growing up and um, growing as a person? All of that really, I mean it, it was seeing energy and it was also having an inner feeling and a connection say primarily to nature and animals. Okay. Uh, because it is a feeling too. You're, you know, it's a, it's not a mind thing. It's a feeling thing. Your true feelings aren't emotions. Your true feelings are vibrational sensations, and you are a vibration of energy and code, say, and so is the rest of the world. Okay, so that's how you develop perception is by fine tuning those sensations. Okay. Now, what would be some of the benefits of somebody actually? doing that, what are some of the benefits of being able to see these energies? Just for somebody who has no idea about this, what would be some of the immediate benefits for them? Well, it's perception. The more perception that you have, the safer you are, the more you know what to do. Instead of being guided by your <clears throat> analytical mind, which is often wrong, you learn to follow your intuition, which is usually correct. Okay. And do you have any memories of uh, your before you came to earth do you have any pre-birth memories and did you know that you were going to be a metaphysical spiritual teacher I didn't necessarily know that I was going to be a metaphysical teacher I don't recall that but I do remember having a form um, which is kind of hard to describe but I do remember before I came here and it was basically a geometrical form of light and it was like um, traveling through a void and I do remember knowing who my parents were going to be before I got here. Okay. And a few other things. Wow. That must have been pretty amazing that um, that you knew about this growing up. And how are the uh, angels that you've seen different from the ones that, like, say, for example, we see in modern day religions that they, they look at they're all, they all have a halo and they, they kind of all look like human beings. What does an angel look like from the way you perceive it to be? Sometimes it can look like that. The halo is a very real thing. The halo is actually a developed crown chakra. Um, it, it becomes a, a fractal disc that expands out, and it receives as well as transmits information. Um, so there is some accuracy to the halo um, depictions, um, but definitely the, um, the way they form to where you see them as being human forms is mostly to do with the human mind translating the energy of it into a way that it can handle it and understand it and relate to it to where it's not too freaked out. <laughs> it's like mind, the mind forms a construct, 
You know, it's a translator. The mind's a translator of information. So it translates the energy that it picks up um, receiving, say, spiritual feelings, which are vibrations and energy, and it makes it into those forms. And then sometimes the beings show up as those forms because they know that if they showed up in other ways that you might not be able to handle it. So it's like, kind of like a two-way communication. Okay, so they show up in things that people are able to perceive. But why do you think that so many people, a, a lot of people, if you want to call it on our planet, seem to not be able to perceive these uh, these things that you're able, that you're discussing? Why do a lot of people, I guess, kind of revert to a scientific mindset, whereas anything that would be considered sixth sense type is is perceived to be uh, crazy in in mainstream, if you want to call it that? Why aren't more people able to see what you're able to see and what uh, some other people are able to see? Well, a lot of the world makes their mind their god. They make mind god rather than um, rather than developing a true spiritual position of um, seeing everything as energy. And the mind is one of the things that you have to transcend. The mind's a bit of a prison, say. And they come into a world and they're programmed into that stance. You know, when little kids are perceiving things that nobody can explain. They haven't really formed into that analytical state yet. They're a lot more open, and they're not as rigidly programmed. So the human experience, the challenges of it are you enter this system of programming and control, which is so rigid and so deep that it trains you to only look at the solid state reality. But if you can maintain an openness um, and not fall into the programming so much, you can still straddle two worlds of perceiving both the physical and non-physical levels of reality. Okay. And uh, Stuart Wilde used to talk about, um, always talked about the journey from uh, ego to true self. And a lot of people are in this life incarnation at this moment, and they're in this system of programming, as you just described. Do you believe that a majority of people on the planet right now have an obligation for their greater evolution to stay in this programming mode and to maybe not push outside? Because if you read one of the, the books I think Stuart had written, it was about the forces that apparently there's this natural state where there are other realities where people are free, where spirit and energy flows freely. And this is a reality where we come to be purposely constricted. So do you think that it's, um, it's for the greater good of an evolution to stay constricted and to not push out. Everybody's here for something different. I'm not saying that the entire world necessarily needs to perceive these things. Um, but in the overall long-term evolution of it all, the spiritual journey is um, neutralizing the ego to where you wipe the ego out, to where you just reach your true and natural self. Okay, and then the other half of it is that you process the shadow because what the programming creates is it creates the outer ego um, of the conscious mind and say the inner shadow. That's just another part of the program. So you get this, this lump sum of negativity that builds up inside which often goes unseen but in order to truly transcend, you have to neutralize the ego, process the shadow, and expand consciousness into subtle vibrations. Okay. Does and that make sense? Yeah, it does. And when you're talking about processing the shadow, can we just delve into that? Because um, you, you've done a lot, you do a lot of work where you're helping people to resolve their shadows, and people say, well, what is my shadow? What is it? Is it a conscious part of you? that is a uh, collection of negative experiences that are kind of pulling you in an ego-based world? Is your shadow um, repressed memories? Is your shadow, um, you know, emotions that you're not willing to acknowledge? I mean, I know that everyone is different, but if you were to, I'm try, I hate to ask, but put it in a simplistic type manner, what would you say that the, the couple qualities and characteristics of a person's shadow are? Like, what is okay. a shadow? Well. First of all, um, the shadow isn't necessarily evil. Um, a lot of people perceive it to be like an evil thing or a bad thing. It isn't necessarily. Um, as you go through life, you have to fit into 
society's behavioral patterns. And if you do something that doesn't fit into whatever little tribal area you're in, if you do something that goes against what they think is normal, it isn't necessarily good or bad, but inside of you, you tell yourself, no, I can't do that, right? So it builds up inside of you as this lump sum of negativity, which is basically everything that you've ever done that you were ridiculed for, or you were told was wrong, you know? It's like, it's like getting a cookie out of the cookie jar before dinner, right? <laughs> is there anything wrong with having a cookie? No, cookie good, you know? The little kid's mind goes, cookie good. But mom slaps your hand and says, you can't have a cookie before dinner. So it confuses the little kid. The little kid knows that the cookie tastes good. What's wrong with it? So it builds up inside as having, say, like a little glitch of what you have to do in order to fit into what's accepted in society. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Now, how does is, how is a person begin to flush out their shadow and – are the ego-based remnants of the shadow, are they predominantly in the conscious or subconscious mind? And can you cleanse your spirit as well as your subconscious simultaneously? How do people go about doing that? Like, what do you think would be, if somebody says, listen, I'm ready to go after my shadow head on, what would be the first couple steps you'd recommend? Well, meditation is the main thing, but there's techniques. You go, you go into meditation, and it's introspection. You look within, you see what pops up, that you have inside of you as those negative inner negativity things, as they come up, you just look at them and you reach an understanding of them. You kind of have to embrace your shadow. I don't mean embrace it to where you become your shadow and live through doing negative things. What I mean by embracing the shadow is that you look at it, you accept like why the little programming aspects were in there, why is there pain in there, why is there negativity in there? You look at it, and through the understanding of it, you transcend it. You purify the shadow. You purify the negative inner aspects, negative inner traits that affect you. Like the subconscious stuff does affect your life, but the more you can process that and clear it out, um, you reach more and more light. Do you think that that could actually have a substantial impact on a person's physical health as well as their weight? I mean, people who are um, of heavier set, do you think that, hypothetically speaking, that their weight could just be a, um, a sign of a lack of balance? Do you think it could be a sign of, of somebody just putting up a force field around them to protect them? Or do you think that their weight could also be unprocessed energy, unprocessed uh, shadow work, if you want to call it that way? Yeah, most of it's unprocessed. That, that um, The inner negativity exists and affects your energy field and the flow of your vibrational rate. So any little block that you have, um, you may not even be aware of it, but there could be like inner negative things that are blocks, but they also create like um, an asymmetrical um, energy pattern or a disruptive energy pattern, which say blocks you. So you may be going, say you want to accomplish something in life that you need to do, but you have like this subconscious um, trait inside that tells you no, that you can't do it. Right? It hinders you from developing. It's the same thing for your health. You know, the, the, the way health is affected more than anything is the quality of a person's energy. Okay. And then it manifests in the human body. You know, the physical world is the manifestation of vibrational forces. Got it. Now, um, in your experience, I've all... I've, one thing people probably don't know if they're aware about this, but you've done a lot of uh, remote healing and you've healed people. And I want to share with the audience uh, the first time I actually met you, which was in 2009 in Las Vegas, and you were working in this big room, and you were you and your um, individuals you were working with, you were performing healings on people. You were pulling things out of people. I didn't know what to expect or what was going on, but I remember that uh, you were with some lady and you were doing something with her, and she let out this growling noise. It was actually like the sound that a, a, every guy probably makes when they realize that they just got married. You know, this. Ah, ah. <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> so, and um, after it happened, I was sitting there, and I started seeing like these these shadowy figures, and I, I looked, and I and I wasn't like freaking out. I mean, they were, they were crawling up and down the walls. I was like, wow, they got some real special effects going on. And apparently that there was no special effects budget. Apparently this was real. 
and um, it, it was just ridiculously amazing and fascinating. And I was wondering what had, what was happening when you were doing these healings, and um, do you have an idea what was coming out of some of these people? Do you actually see like darkness come out of these people? Are there are there dark beings that are occupying these people? Yeah, definitely. So it's there was no special effects. Um, the energies that are affecting people, it's um, some of it is generated from their own inner darkness, and some of it is pushed upon them by, say, the system and other things in reality. You know, everybody's affecting each other. So, okay, so we are. It, it, it can appear at, the way I like to look at it is just fractal codes of energy, and I remove dark energies out of a person's energy field and bring their energy into a symmetry, okay? But because the mind, as I said before, translates things into forms that it can handle and understand, um, everybody's angle of perception is slightly different. So you could see um, a variety of different types of entities flying out of people when you're, when you're doing that kind of work. Okay, and one thing I'll what you're doing is that you're basically, can I accurately say that you work on spiritual DNA, like people have like human DNA and you're kind of working on the spiritual DNA where you're replacing the, the fractal energy that surrounds a person's soul and when you heal that, um, they operate at a, what, a higher vibrational frequency and they're able to, I guess, have a chance to take a breather being under the system of control that they've been under most of their lives. Yeah, I'm not really replacing anything. It's the person's own light that heals them. Okay. When you bring a person's energy into a faster vibrational speed and a symmetry, their own light develops and expands. And, you know, there's obviously the other energies involved or the energies of um, the beings and what I'm doing. But for the most part, it's the person's own energy that heals them because it speeds up into a healthier state. And if you remove the blocks and binds and such, which are embedded on everybody just by living and walking around in the world, there's forces that are constantly bombarding people. So when you clear those, it's like allowing them to breathe again. That's right. And I, that, hypothetically speaking, how often would you recommend a person get a healing done? Um, actually, I don't recommend it that often at all because – um, one of the things I don't like about healing is when somebody just wants the healing and they don't necessarily want to make any changes in their life. It's kind you of know, like lipos, metaphysical liposuction. Yeah, or, you know, I, I always say it's kind of like um, I don't change oil in cars. You know, it's like you just want to take your car in and have the oil changed and so that it keeps running. But if you don't necessarily change anything in your life, um, you know, you can fall back into – patterns that just regenerate what you were trying to fix in the first place. So you have to make a conscious effort to make changes in life as well. So you can't just say, get hit with a magical stick and have everything be done and healed and over. You've got to stick to the plan and make changes. Get to stick to it. Now, when you're doing the healings, you do ones that you're physically present with people and then ones that are remotely. Can you please explain the difference between the two? And when you're doing these healings, are you acting as a mirror for uh, celestial energy, kind of like facilitating celestial energy upon the person, because you have this added perception, this increased perception, you can actually see in a person's etheric and see where they need the healing from. So, are you kind of like a, you know, like a mirror for that? I don't know if a mirror is the right word, but um, it's two different types of um, healing techniques. When you're there in person, um, obviously it's a little bit more hands-on, and um, it also has to do with like. Um, seeing the person's physical features and their reactions as you do things to neutralize their ego and um, change their energy patterns and clear the blocks and blinds. Um, remote healing is a totally different process. It's linked to the ancient Etruscan ways of where um, you rotate into the inner world and you actually locate the person and you work on them from within. So and in that process, everybody experiences it slightly different. From the healer's point of view, it's usually encountering a lot of darkness. From the person's point of view, they usually have, like, um, celestial visions or feel their energy speed up. Okay, so you said you find them in the, um, the alternative. I mean, you're talking about the Aluna, which is... The yeah, you can call it the Aluna if you want. That's just a word for the spirit worlds, really. It's the 
it's the underlying nature of reality is that everything's energy fields. So it's traveling in those energy fields. And consciousness could be anywhere at any given second. It's not limited to the same constraints as like 3D laws of physics are. Okay, so um, you have, I'm just curious, you have the Luna, which is where people are, they have their physical body here, their conscious physical bodies in this reality that we're talking about right now, and then they're in this place called the Luna where they're also residing, a mirror self. Now, are they having mirror selves across all different life incarnations across all dimensions all at the same time? Like, do you have multiple mirror selves in the Luna simultaneously with all of your physical existences at the same time? Correct, but they're not all physical. Um, because the, the, a person has, um, okay, when people talk about past lives and such, they usually think that it's a past life that was in this dimension, so it's another physical form of them. And some of that is true. But a person also has past lives, present lives, future lives, and other dimensional realities that aren't necessarily solid physical realities. Okay, so people already are probably experiencing their, you say that they're already experiencing their future life at this point in time, that they could potentially do a future life regression potentially and see where they actually are maybe 100, and maybe 300 years from now? It's quite possible. Um, the, kind of the way it works is that most of the guides that people experience are actually um, their own higher self coming back in time to assist them along the way in this life. That's amazing. That's really amazing. So hypothetically speaking, you could have this influence that's kind of nudging you in the right direction and it could actually be your conscious from the future time who already foresaw the future the way it is right now? Correct. That's amazing. And who are your guides? And do you mind if I say, and what have they been, how have they influenced your life? Um, what do you have, um, guys? <laughs> You're kind of consulting that. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen a number of, I've had a number of different um, guides and beings, but I kind of know that um, um, it's my own higher self, so I don't really consider them my guides. I just consider it to be me. But I've worked with a lot of other um, beings and such, which I knew also who they were, um, and it's usually your friends in, in the physical plane. Um, so you have, say, like the main beings, like your higher self, that can look like it's outside of you, but as you align to your higher self, you realize, and when I'm in those worlds, I don't necessarily see my higher self. I'm just in those worlds as if I'm looking out my own eyes. Okay. Um, but the other beings and guides can be your friends. It's like having friends in, in the physical plane. You know, they're people that you know. And as you learn to be able to see the higher self of others and their energy, um, it's like you recognize them just the same way as you recognize them in the physical plane. So if I'm in there and there's a being that comes along, it may not look human, but there's something about it that I recognize and just know who it is. And then there's a number there's a number of other beings that people may experience that they only experience them for a brief um, time that they aren't necessarily permanent guides but they come along for whatever reason and they it's usually because they need something like they need help or something. Okay, so um, maybe you bump into a person that maybe needs part of your energy, and um, is that we that what you're talking about? Well, like, kind of. It's like um, most of the beings are wanting. Most of the beings I encounter actually want help. They don't necessarily want to show me anything or or guide me anywhere. They just kind of want assistance or they want a healing or whatever the case may be. Um, I'll give you an example. A number of psychics have asked me why their spirit guides never really give them any information about their own evolutionary journey. And it's like a guide can come in that, say, needs the psychic's help in 3D to find a kid that's lost or something like that. So the being will be there and can help guide them to find the kid, but after they the kid is found and everything, the, the beings don't necessarily have any more information for the person. So the guides will come and go based off of whatever needs to be done. Wow. I think it's probably interesting that they're, that they're coming to you and they're asking you for things. And you could, you know, what do you tell them? Like, listen, I'm in a physical body. I've got a mortgage. I've got kids. I've got to deal with stress. You, you are in a timeless reality. you got none of this stuff going on. Why don't you, you know, 
do your stuff. Do you ever like respond that way? Um. <laughs> well, <laughs> I just don't know. I mean, I figured. I mean, come on, you're you're an attorney, and they're not dealing with the the human day to day stuff. Well, it's it, it's not really. Um, you have to look at it from the point of view that just because something is a spiritual being rather than a physical being, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have any more wisdom or knowledge than you do. Oh. All right. And um, as you got older and you, you grew, um, you know, both as a person and spiritually, who were some of the most influential teachers that you had when you were young, and how did they um, impact your evolution and your perception and made you come to the conclusion that you did at this point? Well, definitely the Eastern philosophies. I mean, I studied just about everything I could get my hands on. Um, a lot of it is stuff I wouldn't recommend people read, but there was I just studied just about everything I possibly could. But I would say the main thing would be Lao Tzu, um, the Tao Te Ching, um, definitely so, and then Stuart. But I, I kind of ditched reading books and studying stuff a long, long time ago because you kind of have to throw all the books out the door. And when you start having those inner world experiences, it just is so far beyond what the books have to say. And in order to really figure it out, you have to go through the processes and techniques of having those experiences directly for yourself. So most of the stuff, say, that Stuart and I worked on, I studied with him for like over 20 years. And then we worked together for a number of years. And most of what we came across was um, direct experiences of being in those other dimensions and then writing about it for people and explaining it to them. Okay. So you kind of have to you have to look at it from the point of view. I can't even remember everything I studied because it was like <laughs> over, over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, whatever. So what you're saying about going to these different – dimensions and traveling because I definitely wanted to focus on that. Now, are you doing this when you're going into a deep theta state and then what happens that when you get to that perception, do you, you kind of flow into different worlds? Like how do you transport or go to various dimensions and what kind of dimensions are out there that you've, um, you've mapped? I mean, you, I know you're working on various things. What, what dimensions do we, that you're aware of that are out there and how do we get to them? Well, that comes down to their techniques where you, you do have to go into trance state. And it, after you work with theta, like I worked with theta for years and years, but eventually you, you go even deeper and you work with delta levels. And, and delta is only like two hertz away from dead. You know, the, it's like two blips a second your brain waves are moving. So it's like it's two beats away from being dead. So it's basically putting yourself in a self-induced near-death experience, <laughs> if that makes sense. All right, so you're in that. Now, how would how do you know what kind of world you're going to? Can you when you're in these deep trance states? Can you basically say to yourself, "Oh, listen, you know what? I'm I'm going to go to a celestial place today. I want to go and see you know some of the angels and you know, hang out." Um, do you can you predetermine where you're going to be? You can to a degree. I mean, the um, I kind of map that out and explain some of the trajectory Stuart and I put together on which areas are what. And you do that by simply allowing your feelings to expand in those areas. Now, the problem is and the challenge is that a person is in certain etheric locations already, all right? So they have to – it's a process. Like they have – they wake up to wherever they're at, and it's not always a pretty place. And the other challenge is there's also a, a matrix um, – which is like a holographic field that's intention is to stop people from seeing and reaching those worlds. So you also have to work on an inner level to escape that holographic field. Okay. We say, and what would be the purpose? I mean, wouldn't the matrix want people to, to go to a hellacious world so they would be afraid so they'd never want to come back, so they'd never want to go into it again? The matrix wants to control you and keep you in those worlds. It wants to control and keep you in a in a hell in a hell type world. And what is that a hell world? Because people talk about. I mean, if you look about some of the religions out there, they say, well, you know, after you know, if you commit what's something called sin, you will go and you will spend an eternity in these uh, worlds that are hellacious. Which, um, what are, what is a hell world from what you've known about it? And how many levels of hell have you personally experienced? There are endless levels of hell, but it's not. It really doesn't have anything to do 
with whether or not you're a sinner or whether or not you're being judged. There's no judgment of it. Um, if a person aligns to being malicious, they create their own darkness, and they basically align themselves to those type of experiences in those worlds. It comes down to vibrational resonance, and the quality of your geometrical fractal codes, which is the energy signatures of who and what you are. If you want to experience celestial worlds, you have to have a celestial resonance. Um, it's like tuning in to a station, okay? There's no judgment to it. There's nobody, nobody's judging you and not allowing you to go to the heavens, and nobody's forcing you to go to the hell. It simply comes down to what frequency are you tuned into. If you're tuned into light and love, you will experience light and love worlds. If you are tuned into being malicious and cruel and harm, then you will experience those type of um, worlds. Right. Can you, when you've uh, traveled there, and you know, if somebody who's got to you know, get a lot of light to you, how couldn't you actually disrupt the entire uh, system by being somebody who's at a higher vibrational frequency and coming down to experience that by your presence alone? Couldn't that actually kind of tilt the entire hell world experience? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. But, um, well, just basically saying, the... yeah, higher vibrational frequency. A person who's at a higher vibrational frequency travels to a hellacious dimension, and they're there. And the hellacious beings see that. And seeing that uh, person who's there who has more love than they have, they aspire to that. And aspiring to that, could they potentially raise their vibrational frequency? And, and then by raising their vibrational frequency, the hellacious world that you just described would it be a step above where it was had you not even been there? I suppose. I don't think it necessarily changes those worlds. I think they'll still exist there. But usually when I go into those kind of places, it's kind of like a rescue mission to help somebody get out of it. Okay. We mean rescue somebody, like somebody who's alive in the present moment or somebody who's passed that you're actively trying to seek? Um, it, it's usually somebody that's alive in 3D, and it's just kind of helping them get through those different dimensions. <laughs> Okay. It's like pulling them out of a bad spot, say, and showing them a, a different trajectory. Wow. And I met, have you ever seen, I'm just, you know, this is a question I'm sure people right now are thinking about, but have you ever seen anyone, like, really famous in there? You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, yeah, because sometimes you always see these people that are there made out to be really good people, and uh, the next thing you know, you're in this trance. You're like, wow, you're in hell? Oh, my God. I had no idea. <laughs> you? Of all people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I've seen tons of people in there, and yeah, a lot of them are famous. But um, I don't, I don't think that um, what people have to understand is that just because a person is experiencing one of those worlds, it doesn't necessarily mean they're an evil person. Because a lot of things are pushed on them, and they're bombarded by darkness in this world. So if they're wrapped up, say, going through a challenging situation, or maybe they're processing something out of their subconscious mind, it can put them in a dark spot. So I, I try never to judge anybody, and I don't like to talk about anybody. So I don't I don't throw oh, no, I don't throw names or anything. But you got it's kind of like in this world, you got to give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean they're condemned. And then there are certainly there are certainly some beings in those worlds that are very very much into being malicious, and they don't really want to transcend that stuff. So, okay, now, but every is every human being alive has the potential to transcend those dark things and align to to light world. All right. Now, if they are, if somebody happens to to uh, physically depart this life incarnation and they're in a state of, like, say, high stress or they're in a state of, um, you know, distress, and they wind up in these uh, darker realities, do they have any hope of pulling themselves out? Because as we have multiple life incarnations going on simultaneously, can you have parts of your conscience in the celestial worlds and parts of your conscience in the hell worlds and those yeah. parts of the conscious and in the hell worlds, do they have a chance of pulling out and unifying with the parts of you in the celestial worlds? Yes. Okay. They're given an opportunity while they're alive in the physical plane to, to transcend that stuff. Um, when a person passes away, the first thing they see is the worlds that they've actually created for themselves that they're in right now. They just don't see it because they don't have the etheric perception and such. But they basically just wake up to whatever inner worlds they're already at, they're already la located in. Um, okay, well, and um, you've had a lot of 
teachers. Um, you've talked a lot about uh, Vishnu and Shiva. And I wanted to know, of all those beings that are out there, what are they here to teach us? I mean, these are these are considered Hindu gods, but apparently they play a prevalent role in what's going on in the reality right now. So are there any of those beings that uh, you feel has a substantial influence over humanity? Well, they, they're basically, say, like cosmic traits or cosmic aspects, you know. They, they don't really look like human beings and such in those worlds. They're fractal geometrical shapes, but they have... Um, they have codes to them, and if people align to them, then basically they align to the energy of, of what those cosmic traits are. You know, like, it's like Christ consciousness, you know. Basically, Christ consciousness is just a consciousness of unconditional love. So anybody that aligns and develops unconditional love basically attains Christ consciousness. It's an energy. It's a feeling. And it has traits to it. It has aspects to it. And speaking of Christ, and speaking of God, have you ever actually met uh, Christ in your experience in your journeys and have you actually ever seen God um, the, the God that people come to know in this most of what people think about God is uh, it's just a big orange blimp really it's not, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not what they think I mean I don't really like the word God because it's like so far beyond that little word it's beyond words it's a uh, the very deepest level, it's a golden resonance of spiraling tubes like laser light and fractal codes of information. And it's um, what people pray to and things like that, they kind of create different forms in those worlds. So most of what people think God is, is it's not what they think, but it's like they create an emotional balloon like a big orange blob of emotion because they think God is somebody that they should complain to or should, <laughs> they should, do you know what I mean, or vent yeah. their frustrations or or dump their emotions on, you know? Right, but sometimes there are people um, in for life where they they want to call upon a um, an energy to a system. Like say, for example, they're, um, they're about to leave work and they're afraid their boss is going to drop something on their desk and say you have to work on the weekend. And they say, oh, God, yeah, come on, I don't want to deal with this stuff. Or, you know, they're praying that the mother-in-law doesn't come by for the weekend. You know, it's like, oh, come on. And, you know, sometimes it happens. So, I've been speaking, where can human beings um, who don't want to deal with the big orange bubble of emotion, where can they draw this energy from? Can they, do they pray to themselves? Do they say, you know, dear me, I, I pray to you to, to make sure the mother-in-law does not come over this weekend? <laughs> well, people create their own reality based off of their inner feelings and their attitudes. Um, but I kind of I don't think of prayer like you have to pray at a certain specific time. I believe walking in a constant prayer, where that's just a constant connection to spirit, a constant connection to feeling and to nature and to people and such. So it's like walking in a constant prayer. You're always always in tune with um, those energies, and when you put your intention towards something, you'll find that it manifests faster. Um, people create their reality all the time, even if they're not aware of it, even if they don't believe it, it still happens. Okay, so... You know, so they can, they can definitely call in energies, and they can call in the feelings, and sometimes that may show up as a being, but more times than not, basically they're just creating their own reality with their own attitude. Like, if they don't want to work on the weekend, um, if their intention is strong enough, then something will happen that will stop that from happening. Right, and can they call upon other uh, beings that are, let's say, uh, beings help helpers for humanity to assist them in their uh, efforts? Are there are a lot of people uh, that uh, go to patron saints, or they go to patron angels like Saint Michael, or they go to a lot of these other ones, and they invoke these beings with with the uh, with the intention of manifesting something physical reality. Um, is that something that you think? can be an effective means to manifest and shape the world that people want to create for themselves. For sure. Um, definitely so. The problem is whether or not the person's intention is um, a good one or not. It, because you also, another part of the journey is you have to transcend desire. If it's just serving the desires of the ego, then it's just creating more of a mess. You have to transcend desire to truly find your mystical destiny, say, rather than just be part of the programming. Uh, and you've talked a lot about what's known as the renewal, and um, a, correct me if I'm wrong, but you described it as a point in time where the spirit of the earth was going to um, 
kind of restored balance, like humanity was maybe uh, taking up too many resources, polluting too much, and they're going to be rebalancing, or the renewal was supposed to be a renewal of, of human, um, I don't know, passion for metaphysics and spirituality, rediscovering who they really are. How do you see the renewal, and what is your interpretation of it, and have you seen it already occur in a different reality? I've definitely seen it um, happen in the inner worlds and through visions and such, um, but it's not exactly what everybody thinks, you know. Like, basically a renewal is any cataclysmic event, any kind of earth change that causes a shift. Um, the earth, or if you want to call it Gaia, has a collective consciousness, you know. It's like a higher spirit. And the energy evolves just like anything else. The energy speeds up. And that causes shifts in human consciousness because humans are part of that, all right? Okay. But and the, re the renewal, as far as it being one huge cataclysmic event that happens on one given day or something like that, I don't think that's as likely. I think it happens over time um, through a variety of different things. Okay. And in your experience, is the future for you, is it becoming harder to predict and harder to, to see things? Do you think the energy of the planet is speeding up so much to the point where people's um, energies are changing constantly and it's difficult to gauge where the future might go? Um, I don't really worry about the future. I, I, it's more like you got to transcend that stuff in order to stand in an eternal state in the now, to be present in the moment in the now in order to perceive energy and such. I, if you get to, if you lean into the future, it blinds you. You know, and it creates fear and it creates worry and it pushes things away. But in order to create a reality of your own and manifest things, you have to be good, solid, and strong in the now, in the moment, in the present. Awesome. Chris, this has been an incredible, incredible interview, and um, I'm completely blown away. I really am blown away. I'd like to know if you can please just tell our listeners about the Hooded Sage course, how you got it started, and where they can sign up for it. Okay. Um, well, the Hood of Sage course is basically the Ptolemaic Honor Code. Um, Stuart asked me to write out a system of teachings for people because um, he and I had been working together for years, and he wanted to um, – um, it was kind of like a changing of the guard, I guess you could say. But we worked together for many years, and he asked me to write it out for people to show them how to um, develop their perception and inner power and such. And so that's how that all came about. Um, just after working for so long together and having many of these experiences in these other worlds, um, I pretty much left this world again and then came back and just kind of wrote things out. So Stuart, Stu, it's Stuart's idea to do the hoodedsage.com, which is basically just an honor of the higher self and those um, beings that we're linked to from the ancient Taoist sages. Okay, and uh, actually to, to the listeners out there, I've been on the Hooded Sage, I've been a member, and it, it's fantastic. You really engage in incredible discussions with people who are just as passionate, just as inquisitive as you are, and if you write questions, Chris personally answers the questions. So if you really are passionate about this and you really are curious about opening up this door that's out there, which I have never seen anything like this before, I highly, highly recommend you go to thehoodedsage.com and you join. It's uh, definitely worth it. So, um, Chris, thank you. Thank you so much. It was a truly an honor uh, to have you on the program today. And on behalf of myself, on behalf of all the listeners out there, we wish you infinite peace and love in all that you are and all that you do. And uh, we thank you so much for being a part of the program today. Thank you, Ryan.